And then the second one that's a little smaller, libertinism and legalism. You got a front and back for that one with a nifty little chart that's on the back there. That's only the first part of the chart. So the next part of the chart is on the front of this page. So that continues that. And then you got the back of that page, and this is a four pages per, per one page. That's why it's so small. But this is a blog that you can have access to online if you want to see it all blown up. And I can give you a link to that blog if you would rather have a link to the blog instead of trying to read that little tiny font there. And it's a part one, and then this one has the same picture, but it's a part two, front and back. So there's just a quick overview of those handouts. And if you need a magnifying glass, I understand, or a link to that blog. But I really didn't want to print out like eight pages for that blog times 20 of you just for, I mean, that would not be good for the printer. So that's why I did it that way, even though I know it's hard to read. So if you need uh, handouts, I put one every other chair if you want to share with a family or uh, there's some extras or I can get it to you. Or best of all worlds, just email me and I can send you an electronic copy and then you can blow it up as much as you want to read it. So hopefully those handouts are helpful to you. Um, the reason why I have all those handouts is because what I'm talking about today is probably going to be the most controversial thing that we could talk about. So I'm trying to explain myself more to prevent misunderstanding and provide more background and details that, so you know that I'm aware of some of these things that are controversial. So we are um, doing uh, communicating a biblical worldview to our children. Focus mostly on children, but you can apply it to communicating a biblical worldview to anybody. And we're over halfway through in our series. The goal is that we as parents or grandparents would seek to instill a biblical worldview in our children. And we know that that's difficult in our day when there's a lot of things that are up against us in, in undermining the biblical worldview. And a lot of people are deconstructing their biblical worldview or their Christianity even if they had grown up in Christian homes. So the question is, how can we best seek to be faithful? We can't force our children to have a biblical worldview, but we can seek to communicate that biblical worldview as clearly and as purposefully as we possibly can, and depend on God's grace, that they would delight to embrace the biblical worldview. So that's the vision and goal of this class. So far, we have defined a biblical worldview, and who can tell me right now, what are the three main ingredients of a biblical worldview? If you learn anything from this class, I hope you can walk away knowing the three main ingredients of a biblical worldview. Creation, flow, and redemption. Okay, that's part of one of the ingredients. Oh, you mean yep. meta-narrative. Yep, the, yes, the meta-narrative or master story of the world, which in the biblical worldview is creation, fall, redemption. That's our master story of the world. And does anybody know what main worldview question that answers? What's the big question that that answers? We're answering the question, what is reality? So what is reality? You point them to creation, fall, redemption. That's the master story of the world that orients them to the reality of this world. All right, and then uh, what is the second main biblical worldview ingredient? Yes, your beliefs and values. And what's the big worldview question that we're answering there? What is truth? What is truth? So what is reality? What is truth? You got your master story of the world, creation, fall, redemption. It tells you reality. You got biblical doctrine. It tells you what is truth. And then what's the third worldview ingredient? Personal behavior and cultural engagement. Yep. And that answers the question... How then shall I live? So that's the ingredient that we're going to be addressing today, the um, third worldview ingredient. Um, but, but moving on, let, let's do this overview of the lessons. Um, lesson two, we talked about postmodernism, and postmodernism attacks reality. There is no reality. There is no truth, and there is no ethic that you have to live by, no transcendent ethics. So it undermines the biblical worldview in every single one of those ingredients. So then after dealing with defining the biblical worldview and understanding the dominant worldview of our time, postmodernism, specifically expressive individualism, I can express myself however I want, 
There's no truth that constrains me. There's no reality that constrains me. There's no ethic that constrains me. After dealing with postmodernism, then we started breaking down the biblical worldview into its parts and pieces. So lesson three, we talked about laying down the foundation of a biblical worldview, and that's explaining the gospel within the framework of creation, fall, redemption. Then we magnify the centrality of, of a biblical worldview, and that's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Then we talked about establishing stability. Where does this worldview come from? It comes from God's word. So we need to defend God's word or have confidence in the Bible as the authoritative presentation of truth and reality. It's the source of the biblical worldview. Last week, we talked about capturing the heart, how affection drives cognition, or somebody's treasure box of their heart. Is it submitted to Christ? That will orient or help them to be able to interpret and understand everything that we're talking about. Or if it's idolatrous, tilted away from Christ, then they will reject everything that we're talking about here. And it boils down to Proverbs 1-7. The fear of the Lord, which is an affection, is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. That's your cognition. So if somebody fears God, then they will have wisdom and knowledge. If they don't fear God, then they're a fool, Proverbs 1-7 says, and they will not be teachable. They will not be instructed. So affection drives cognition. You have to capture the hearts of your children. This week, we're looking at a largely missing component that is a cultural philosophy, <laughs> Christ and culture. And this is as important as doctrine. Next week, we'll continue our discussion on culture, that enculturation is probably more influential on your children than formalized teaching that they receive. And then we'll get on to some other topics. But I just wanted to orient some people. I know some people have missed weeks, or this is your first time here. So this week, we're, we are talking about Christ and culture, and we'll talk about what that means. Basically, it refers to the Christian's relationship to culture. How should we, as Christians, relate to the culture around us? So here's our three ingredients, and we've covered meta narrative, beliefs and values, and now we're getting to this third ingredient. And some of you might be like, yay, we're finally getting practical, we're going to get into application. But it's also probably the most controversial thing that we're going to talk about, right? <laughs> don't, don't you think this is probably going to be the most controversial, how we apply our beliefs and values to everyday life? Probably. But we do need to make personal application, or we've short-circuited the biblical worldview. I mean, one of the biggest complaints about biblical worldview as a discipline is that it's so theoretical and it's so intellectual. Were the first few weeks kind of intellectual? <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the biggest complaints about biblical worldview. And uh, biblical worldview, the last 10, 20 years in the discipline, they've been really trying to drive towards more concrete application, making it practical, and you really haven't completed doing the job unless you're actually making it meaningful to life. So we do need to make personal application, even if it is more controversial. And we do need to participate in culture. So... You see the, the picture there. God's word has to be the foundation to our Christian living. And our Christian living needs to be informed by both doctrine and, I would say, a clearly understood philosophy of life. Both of them. Now, there's some people, they just want pragmatic, give me the five steps on how to be successful in this way, and they ignore doctrine. And that tends to lead to legalism and um, Pharisaism and a lot of misinformed kind of living because it's not rooted in doctrine. Behavior really does need to grow out of solid beliefs. But some people, they understand that doctrine ought to direct their behavior, but they don't realize that they also need a philosophy that directs their behavior. Um, so we're going to talk about both pillars being important, both your doctrine and a clearly laid out philosophy on how both of those should be drawn from God's word. God's word is the foundation. Doctrine is basically you're, you're taking everything that scripture teaches and they're like all these different puzzle pieces and you're putting it together into a harmonized picture. They all fit together. Same thing with philosophy. This is not something that's, that's not coming from God's word. You're taking everything that God's word says about things and you're putting it together into a conclusion of therefore this is how I then should live. So both doctrine and philosophy leading to our Christian living, all based in God's word. So let's talk about doctrine first. What is most needed 
as this pillar for our Christian living, it's a sound doctrine, particularly of the doctrine known as progressive sanctification. We have to have a right doctrinal, biblical understanding of progressive sanctification. If you get that doctrine wrong, your Christian living is going to be misdirected instead of being led by this doctrine of progressive sanctification. This is a specific paradigm for making personal application. So that's the focus. Remember, our worldview ingredients, it's personal behavior and cultural engagement. So I'm focusing on the personal uh, in the personal behavior part here with this doctrine. But also a sound philosophy of Christ and culture, and this is a specific paradigm for the cultural engagement part. So we got two different parts to this third ingredient, personal behavior and cultural engagement. And there's two important things, these two pillars, that will help rightly direct your Christian living as a doctrine of progressive sanctification and a philosophy of Christ and culture. All right, let's start out with progressive sanctification. And obviously, I could spend a whole entire lesson, actually, I could probably spend a whole 12 weeks just talking about the doctrine of progressive sanctification and getting that right. So I have very limited time. All I have time is to highlight a few key things about progressive sanctification. Number one, fundamentally, salvation is union with Christ. When we receive the Holy Spirit at regeneration, at conversion, when we're saved, this is a, a promise and benefit of the new covenant where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us and he unites us to Christ. Think of all the passages in the New Testament that talk about us being in Christ. That is the Holy Spirit connects us to Christ. And all of the other aspects of salvation... All the other benefits of salvation flow out of us being in union with Christ, being in Christ. Salvation is being complete in him, Colossians says. So what are some of these other aspects of salvation that flow out of being in union with Christ? Well, I only have two of them highlighted here, but there's more than just justification and regeneration. There's redemption, there's adoption, so other aspects of salvation. If you were to pick up a theology book on salvation, they would break it down in all these different categories or aspects. We're just focusing on justification and regeneration in this picture. Justification is us being declared righteous. This is a legal declaration that God the Father views us through Jesus Christ because we're in union with him that he sees us as righteous. The righteousness of Christ is placed onto us or imputed onto us. So we are justified and we are then saved from sin's penalty. And that leads to a righteous standing before God so that we are secure in God's acceptance. This is a doctrine of justification. But notice that this is not the only <coughs> benefit or the only aspect of being in union with Christ, of our salvation. There's also regeneration. Regeneration is what the Bible talks about when it says you must be born again. When Ephesians 2 talks about us being dead in our sin, and we need God to come in and transform our heart, make us alive from within, so that we are responsive. If you're dead, you're not responsive. God is the one who regenerates, makes us responsive to him. So that we will embrace the things of God. And he totally transforms us. Where I believe it's 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that we're new creatures. We're a new creation in Christ. When we get saved, we don't just, oh, sign my contract, got myself to heaven. I can keep living however I want. That's not what the Bible teaches. We have justification, but also regeneration. He makes us alive. And so we're saved from sin's power. Romans 6 says that we're no longer slaves or enslaved. We're no longer obligated to sin. We can still choose to sin before we were saved. We had no choice. We, we were never going to do anything good with the right motive to glorify God. We were enslaved to be self-serving and idolatrous. Salvation released us so that we are no longer obligated to idolatry. We've been regenerated, saved from sin's power. So now... There's this battle between our flesh that's still within us, Galatians 5.16, and the Holy Spirit who is within us, battling our flesh. And we have this choice. Are we going to yield to the Spirit or are we going to yield to our flesh? 
if we're regenerated, truly regenerated, we should start showing a pattern of yielding to the Spirit because we're safe from sin's power. We're no longer obligated. This is a definitive change that takes place in your life when you're converted. You're regenerated. Your, your whole inward posture towards God, your affections that we talked about last week, should now be tilted towards God. So some people call this definitive sanctification. Where does sanctification begin? What is it rooted in? It's rooted in the fact that you've been regenerated. It doesn't begin like 10 or 20 years after you've been saved. It should begin immediately at salvation because at salvation you were regenerated. You were born again. You were given new life. You were transformed. You're a new creature. There's a definitive change where you were once walking this way, but you've repented and now... God is your Lord, and you're walking this way. Even though you might still feel the pull of sin, your direction has changed. So you're regenerated. You're saved from sin's power. But we still struggle against sin's pollution. Did you realize that the uh, illustration of Jesus um, in the upper room, washing his disciples' feet, it is an illustration of servanthood and humility, but it's more than that. What did Peter say? Lord, I don't want you to wash my feet. Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. He's like, Jesus, wash my whole body. He's like, you don't need to be washed again, your whole body. What is he talking about there? Justification. I've already washed your whole body, but your feet, as you walk along through this life, get dirty by sin. You need, me to, you need to be sanctified. And if you refuse to be sanctified, you don't show any evidence of being regenerated. But if you are regenerated, then you will show that evidence, and you will need your feet daily to be cleansed to be washed over and over and over again you don't need to be justified again but you need to be sanctified because we are all struggling against sin's pollution this is progressive sanctification so, so a, a couple of key verses philippians 2 12 through 13 tells us that who whose work is it for us to be sanctified is it our work or god's work Oh, it's a trick question. It's both. <laughs> it's responsive participation in the work of God. Who gets the ultimate credit? God working in us. Why would we ever do anything correct or right? Because of God's grace working in us. God gets all the credit. But do we actively participate in submitting and seeking to be obedient? Absolutely. So it's, it's, um, it's a participation in God's work for sanctification. Not for justification, but for sanctification. And ultimately, one day, we will be delivered from sin's presence. That's in glorification. That's perfected sanctification. So there's definitive sanctification, progressive sanctification, and perfected sanctification. Now, a couple errors that we want to guard against before I get to this one would be uh, the idea that you can be perfected based on your own efforts or ritualistic behaviors before glorification. No, you cannot be perfected. You're always going to have sin in this world and sin in your, in, in your flesh that you're battling against until you're glorified. We're never above this world of sin, but we should be progressively growing in our, our um, maturity in saying no to sin. Um, so one of the most helpful books on progressive sanctification, since I don't have time to do a whole lesson on it, <coughs> just recommend this book, An Infinite Journey. And your first handout with all these different graphs um, come from this book. But he gives a nice, this is one of the more detailed, practical books on sanctification that I've read. He, he lays out this pathway to Christian maturity. And the whole entire book is, is going into detail on each one of these points in this box. How you need to grow in your knowledge of scripture and your experiential knowledge of living in God's world. And then you need to grow in your faith and grow in your character, and he breaks that down into your affections, your desires, your wills, your thoughts, your emotions. It then produces virtue in you of who you are. And then that translates into action, your actual habitual obedience in your lifestyle. The whole entire book follows this plan of detailing every single one of those points in this chart. It's very helpful. But one of the most helpful things that I found in this book, usually progressive sanctification is illustrated like this. And there's two key assumptions of progressive sanctification. We're not perfected in this life. We're not above the pollution of sin in this life. Romans 5.17 talks about this flesh and spirit battle within the believer. 
Romans 8.13 commands us that we're supposed to be putting sin to death. We're supposed to be mortifying it. So we have this battle with sin. We, we are not perfected in this life or above sin, but we will engage in the fight against sin. Another key of progressive sanctification is that there will always be some evidence of Christian growth or fruit. One of the basis for assurance of salvation is that you're bearing fruit. The Holy Spirit testifies to you. You call out to God. You have a relationship with God. You believe what the scripture says about salvation, but you also bear fruit. So some evidence of Christian growth or fruit will be part of the picture to give us assurance of genuine salvation. So since this results from regeneration and the giving of the Spirit at conversion, usually you should see some evidence of that beginning some transformation in somebody's life. So you see... And this layout, you have conversion, and you have growth being shown at conversion. And you see this, it's an up and down battle with sin until your physical death, and then you're glorified, and that's when you're perfected in Christ. So this is normally how progressive sanctification has been illustrated <coughs> for many, many years. Now, the helpful thing about this is this, this guy maintains this doctrine based on scripture of progressive sanctification. But there's some people who have disputed this. They say, well, my experience doesn't really jive with this. And what, what's our response? Well, doctrine should be what helps you interpret your experience rather than experience reinterpreting doctrine. So you need to be clear on what scripture teaches but it's true. You still have to grapple with people's experiences in life, do you not? And you can say, yeah, I just can see how some people's experience, you don't see this massive growth right when they're saved. It comes years later, maybe with some crisis experience. Now, that's known as perfectionistic system of, of, of sanctification. This crisis experience, this second blessing, maybe it's speaking in tongues. So we're not, we're not saying that we agree with that. But helpfully... This guy in this book, who maintains progressive sanctification because of the doctrine, reckons with different people's experiences in life. And so he says, okay, this is what we would want to expect, ideally, this consistent, abundant fruitfulness in a Christian, but that's not always what we observe. Sometimes you do see a late bloomer, where you look at their life and you go, you know, I'm sure I really did believe the truth of the gospel, and I really did give my life to Christ, but... For whatever reason, I didn't grow in Christ, and I didn't exhibit that much fruit. Now, you can see in this graph, he is showing that there's some evidence of fruit here. Otherwise, at that key moment, if there was zero fruit before that, we would say, hmm, maybe you weren't truly saved. Maybe you got saved at that key moment, and that's when you really got saved. But some people, they do show some minimal progress in their faith, some minimal maturity, but there is a key moment later in their life where they start getting serious where either they come across better biblical teaching or better influences, or whatever it may be, there's a key moment in their life that goes, you know, I need to get serious about my faith and live for God, and they start growing and showing fruit. You know, there's some other experiences that we may observe. There's the thief on the cross. Do you see a long life of fruitfulness after he got saved? No, because there is the reality that some people can be saved right at their death, and they're glorified and perfected the next day. The next hour. So that's another possibility. There's also those who can be restored from great sin. You see them, they're living for Christ, and then they fall into grievous sin. And you're like, I'm not sure if this person's really saved. They wouldn't have done that if they were saved, right? But then they repent and they're restored. And we see that in, in the epistles where somebody can be restored from great <laughs> sin. And in your handout, I have biblical examples for every single one of these as well. Uh, you can also see that there's those who forsake their first love. This was the problem with the church of Ephesus in Revelation, where they had a love for God, they plateaued, and they forsook their first love. And you can see some people, you may not be real sure. You might not have assurance of their salvation. They could be secure in Christ, but you might not have assurance because of what happened at the end of their life. And maybe some of these people truly are saved, but they forsook their first love. There are those who can be mired in mediocrity. For whatever reason, they never get in a healthy church that is solidly teaching them the truth, and they are just baby Christians their whole life. That's a possibility that he leaves open. Still following the system of progressive sanctification. Uh, there can be an ultimate discipline for sin. 
uh, there's a verse in First John, First John five, I believe it says that there's a sin unto death. That's a controversial passage, and how you interpret that, I take it as there could be somebody who has such a bad testimony for for God, and they're really saved, but they refuse to repent, and there's being such a bad testimony. God can say, "Fine, I'm going to take you home," and that ends their simple lifestyle because God takes them. That's a possibility. So. All of that is in my assumptions, this theology of progressive sanctification when I'm talking about Christian living. Um, we need to be rightly motivated in our practice. So what's, what's orienting uh, our Christian living is this doctrine of progressive sanctification. And when we're making applications, it needs to be based on our beliefs, our doctrine, that then results in our behavior. Not a legalistic kind of thing where we're just standard driven and we're just pragmatic, and but it needs to be directed by doctrine, specifically progressive sanctification. So we do <coughs> want to avoid both legalism and license, and that's the second handout that I gave you there, which I really do not have time to talk about legalism and license, but I want you to be aware that I'm aware that these are both ditches, that we want to avoid both legalism and license, and that handout will help you with scripture verses and charts and some description of what legalism is and what license is and how do we avoid both ditches. So hopefully that handout is helpful to you. But what I want to focus on in class is discerning whether an application is rooted in truth. We want to move from truth to application. And how do we know that this application is rooted in the truth? It's rooted in biblical doctrine. Well, we have to carefully analyze why there might be a disagreement over an application instead of the cop-out response that, well, there's a bunch of gray areas, just live and let live. What's right for me is right for me. What's right for you is right for you. That's a cop-out. That's postmodernism, actually. It says, what's right for me is right for me. What's right for you is right for you. We might spiritualize it. Some people say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit leads me one way, and the Holy Spirit leads you another way. Okay. You think God is going to lead two different people in two different ways. Okay, okay, I understand what they might mean. We can have different situations. So the Holy Spirit is applying the same biblical principle, but he's applying it in a different way, not because truth has changed, not because morality has changed. He's not going to contradict his truth. The Holy Spirit's not going to contradict his morality, but you might be in a different situation so that truth and morality is applied in a different way. But what, what do we mean by, well, the Holy Spirit led me this way? How does the Holy Spirit lead? Does he lead with voices in our head? Does he lead with uh, some kind of subjective impressions? No, that's not how the Holy Spirit leads. If you want to say, the Holy Spirit's leading me this way, the Holy Spirit's leading you that way, then you better have a Bible verse that you're pointing to on how and what it is exactly that the Holy Spirit's leading you with, because the Holy Spirit only speaks through his word. So it's really a dodge to say the Holy Spirit's leading me this way and you that way. No, actually, show me some Bible verses on why you are persuaded that in this situation, God is directing you this way, and let's examine it. So here's a better way. Instead of the cop-out response, of, well, he just leads us all in different ways, or, oh, there's just a bunch of gray areas. Now, gray areas, that can be right. There, there can be um, difficult Things that it's hard to understand. There's different positions amongst people, but gray areas is not well. There's a bunch of things that are just amoral. No, there's there's right and there's wrong, and there's some things that are not inherently immoral, but there's a value system that's always laden with everything in this world, and I hope to show you that in a second. This is a better way of moving forward when there's disagreements. Instead of just saying, oh, let's just live, live, live and let live, postmodernism. All right, let's look at the first one, column here. What is your absolute truth? Is there a biblical or principle or command from the Bible that we can point to? Sometimes the disagreement is right here in this first column. People are not operating off of the same authority source. And this can go both ways. The legalist. I had an experience in ministry where I was told that such and such a person is the, with a capital T, interpretation of the truth, and you will not contradict him in what you're teaching in Sunday school. Okay, so this person's inerrant, a 
apparently. Mm -hmm. And this person has the same authority as the Bible and all of his basic principles for life, which were like detailed, thick books of every knit and tittle of everything in your life. How you do your makeup, how you do your hair, everything, knit and tittle. Everything is exactly the principles of life and how you should live, and you will not contradict him. Okay, so what's your actual authority? It is this guru, not the Bible. Because you know what else they said in conjunction with that? Doctrine doesn't matter. In fact, that was their mantra. Doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine doesn't matter. Doctrine doesn't matter. Like, do you know what doctrine is? Yeah. Doctrine is the teaching of scripture. You're telling me that this guru, I will not contradict that he's inerrant and that the teachings of scripture should be thrown out. And I tried to show them doctrine and they go, no, we don't want any of your doctrinal discussion. And your problem is you just hate this guy. And I was like, I didn't even know this is what the guy taught. I'm just teaching the Bible. And they didn't like it that I was just teaching the Bible. That's somebody who, why are they applying things differently from me? Because they have a different authority <laughs> source that led them to legalism. Now this can be on the other extreme too, of license, where you have explicit, you can point to a Bible verse where they are blatantly um, disobeying that Bible verse. Straight out what it says and what they're doing. It's a perfect match. There's no dispute. Nobody could dispute it that they're violating that Bible verse. You point them to that Bible verse and they brush it off. So what authority are they living by then, even though they claim to be a Christian? If you can point them Chapter and verse, it's explicit, it's blatant, and they refuse it. They're living by a different authority. They are not living by the authority of the Bible. So some of our disputes are right there in that first column. Now, hopefully, those are on the fringe. Hopefully, we're healthier than that. Sometimes, it's a matter of interpretation. So either they are being too selective of their scripture passages that they use to guide their life, they're very one-sided. They, they use all the Bible verses against legalism, and they ignore all the Bible verses against license. Or they use all the Bible verses against license, and they ignore all the Bible verses against legalism. You have people who live in those two ditches, one of those two ditches. Um, they, they haven't, they're, they're being too selective in their use of Scripture. Or it may be a particular Bible passage. They're misinterpreting it. And so they, they have a conviction based on misinterpreted Scripture. That could be one thing. They don't properly understand the truth or the teachings of Scripture. The biblical demand that they understand is off base. And there's a dispute over what the biblical demand is. Now, I don't think that's where most of our disagreements come from, at least with mature Christians that have been in the church and well taught. I think most of the disagreements come in these third and fourth columns, the convictions and the standards. So the conviction is taking the truth stood, that's the indicative, and turning it into the truth defined, or making the indicative into an imperative. And of course you have this in a lot of the epistles, where the epistles are very doctrinal, like Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, and then they become very applicational, that's Ephesians 4 through 6. There's a lot of indicative truth proclaimed in the first three chapters, and a lot of imperatives or commands in the last few chapters. We have to translate the truth understood into the truth defined. And this is our persuasions or our convictions. Um, and then lastly, there's the standards, the practical application or the actual rules of life, what we live by. And um, I believe the greatest gap is probably between those convictions and standards. A lot of times we can, we, when, we can convince ourselves that this is the biblical conviction of this is how it ought to live, but do we live consistently with that, even ourselves? And then with others. You might be able to persuade them of the conviction, but then they're really not consistent on how they're living that out. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a path that helps us to, to um, settle disputes in a way that's not just postmodern. So all of this answers these three questions, that whole scheme that I laid out there. When Christians need to make ethical decisions in life, there are always three major factors involved that must be clarified. What is the situation? What does God's word say? And what is your motive? Biblical wisdom is the application of God's revelation to a problem by a person. And some of the differences that we have amongst ourselves is because the situation is different. Um, it's not that God's morality has changed or his... Um, <coughs> 
truth has changed. Let me give you an example. Why do we not follow all the laws of Israel, all the Old Testament law? Because our situation has changed. We're under the new covenant now. We're not under the old covenant. And we're not a theocratic nation that's an agrarian society living out in the desert. So our situation has changed. Has God's character changed? Has his morality changed? Has his truth changed? None of that has changed, but we're in a different situation. So it's not the same as situation ethics, but you can recognize that situations do change. So whether based on specific scriptural commands, these are things that are primary level, they're explicit, the propositions, they're imperatives, you can go right to the text and find it, or whether it's a principle or an implication from scripture, convictions and standards will be based on all three of the following. Christian theology, what do we believe? Christian ethics, how are we to live in relation to God and others? Carrying out the two greatest commandments, to love God and others. And Christian experience, who um, we are as Christians who fear the Lord. Um, John Frame is actually the theologian who came up with this scheme. It's called triperspectivalism, which is a fancy way of saying there's three perspectives that always have to come into play when we make application. He calls the one normative, that's what is the truth, what does the Bible say, Christian theology. He calls the second one situational. Am I properly evaluating the situation? Sometimes I'm not rightly understanding the culture. I'm presuming things about the culture, but it's not true. Um, and then our motivation, our inner motivation. The Bible is concerned not only that we do the right thing, but why are we doing what we're doing? Our motivations matter too. So... When we look at this chart, Bible interpretation, convictions, and standards, Bible and interpretation would be the normative perspective. What is the truth? Convictions would be the situational, or, or the, um, I think it's the existential, my motives. And the standards would be in the situation, applying that to the situation that I'm in. Those are always the three factors. And you could put this into a syllogism. Do you guys remember, like, freshman class English, when you did syllogisms? which is a major premise and a minor premise leading to a conclusion. So your major premise is your claim of this is what biblical truth is. This is, my authority is the Bible, and I'm properly interpreting it. That's the biblical truth understood. Minor premise is your conviction in a cultural situation. So this is your conviction, that third column. And then your conclusion is your personal standard or your practice. While you're motivated to live out a certain way. So biblical truth interpreted should lead to conviction. There's often a blatant disconnect between what people say they believe and what they're actually convicted about. But the indicative, the truth understood, demands the imperative, the truth applied. And this is a good book that makes this very point that there's a massive disconnect between what we say we believe and how we actually live. R. Kent Hughes, who's the pastor at Wheaton uh, for many, many years, calling a worldly church to godly life. This is something that he observed, and he uses the story of Lot to prove his point. Was Lot a righteous man? The New Testament says he was, right? <laughs> Would you know that he was a righteous man by the narratives in the Old Testament? There's a massive disconnect in how he is living and what he actually knew was the truth. And so there was a disconnect between his convictions and what he knew and how he should live. So going on, conviction should lead to the standard. And the gap between the conviction and the standard is what must be proved, and this is where a lot of Christians end up finding their disagreements. The bottom line is that the conclusion that people draw, and they must prove their conclusions, are legitimately derived from biblical convictions. That's A and B. If the conclusions are valid, then it's legitimate to press home the standard. Absolute biblical truth demands a conviction put into practice through a biblical standard. So I have a few concrete examples for you. So biblical truth understood. I should not be conformed to the world. Can you find a biblical passage that says this straight up? Mm -hmm. Yep, Romans 12, 2. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Talks about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. I should not be conformed to this world. Now, we need to be careful that we're rightly defining what worldliness is, because that can be wrongly defined, wrongly described, wrongly understood. I understand that. Um, but this is a biblical principle that we should not be conformed to the world. There's something about the spirit of the age that's in rebellion against God that we must recognize that we should not be conformed to rebellion against God. That's the major premise. Now, the minor premise will get into describing what that actually is, and that's where a lot of people disagree. 
But here's an example, and I'll let you pick your own. Game of Thrones came to my mind, but you can pick your own. Pick a specific television show or movie that is conformed to this world. In other words, you can find specific, objective, concrete evidence that it blatantly disregards and disqualifies itself from obedience to Scripture and Scripture's morality. All right, I think we can do that. We should be able to. So here's the proof. You have to prove your minor premise. The show includes objectively identifiable examples of explicit, pervasive, and consistent immoral connotations presenting an unbiblical moral tone that supports sexual immorality as a way of life. And Proverbs 14, 16 says that the fool is the one who goes on to allow for this, but the, the wise person turns away from this stuff. So if we're wise, we would turn away from it. So my personal standard of practice, I won't watch such and such. Ephesians 5, 3 through 17, it's a detailed text about discerning the will of the Lord in our lifestyle and our love for the Lord and how it should direct us. Galatians 5.25 says, if you live in the Spirit, if you claim to be saved and you have the Holy Spirit in you, then we should walk in the Spirit. We should yield to Him. So let me give you, uh, oh, by the way, Christian Education as Mandate and Mission has a whole entire chapter on <laughs> censorship and what, what biblical censorship looks like, and that's where I got the categories here of explicit, pervasive, consistent and moral connotations and unbiblical moral tone, and he expands a whole lot on that. Let me give you one that is completely bogus. So ho hopefully you can see that the syllogism is helpful. Biblical truth understood. I should not be indecisive. James 5, 12. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Is that verse talking about indecisiveness? I don't think it is. Okay. We could argue about the interpretation of that verse. I think it's talking about you need to be truthful and not a hypocrite. Let your yes be yes. Don't, don't be somebody who says yes but really means no. Don't be a liar. I think that's what it means. Some people, okay, uh, let's, let's grant it to them. Let's say that verse is talking about being indecisive. Or let's say there's another verse in the Bible that tells us not to be indecisive. Okay, let's grant them the major premise, just for argument's sake, even though I don't think that verse means that. But you see a lot of people misinterpret Scripture like this. All right, let's go to the second one, the conviction in a cultural situ situation, the minor premise, where they're trying to connect the biblical principle. And a lot of times they'll skip over their minor premise, by the way, and go right to the conclusion. The Bible says not to be indecisive. Therefore, they come to their conclusion, ignoring the fact that they haven't even argued their minor premise to prove it. But here's the minor premise. Parting your hair down the middle. Does anybody have their hair parted down the middle? <laughs> Dennis, is your hair parted down the middle? <laughs> Parting your hair down the middle either causes you to be indecisive, and we know that's unbiblical, or it reflects that you are indecisive, and we know that's unbiblical. So, I will not part my hair down the middle, and you better not either, or you're unscriptural, you're evil. I know, okay, I made this out of a joke, right? Mm -hmm. This one's obvious. Are there other things that are less obvious than this, but people are doing the exact same thing? They claim a biblical principle that's bogus, they don't even argue a minor premise that's just assumed and hidden, and they come to this conclusion, and this is called human tradition. This is not scripture. This is not biblical application. This is not applying a biblical principle or implication to life. This is human tradition. All right, so um, we only got through the first half today, which is fine because I knew we were going to continue on next week. But here's some resources that are helpful. Dr. Schnoberger was one of my teachers at Detroit Baptist Theological Seminary, and he has um, a pastor's conference lecture on definitive sanctification that will explain in a whole lot more detail those charts that I have in that handout on legalism and license are drawn from Dr. Snowberger's lecture here. Um, is sanctification a part of the gospel for which we are together? And he's just highlighting the importance of sanctification being just as important as justification to unite us together as believers. There's a blog post by Leighton Talbert. He's a professor at BJ Seminary. It's called the Sanctification Spiral. And what he's dealing with there is what should, prior, what should we prioritize? I love and delight for God or obedience to God? And he's like, uh, yes, <laughs> both, both and. Uh, but there's people who argue what should drive you as more, more fundamental. And his thing is like, it's an interactive 
thing. It's a spiral. It goes back and forth. Your love for God should direct your obedience. Your obedience should direct your love for God. It's a both and, and it just interacts. Don't try to prioritize one or the other. They both, there's a fitting way to fit them both together. Uh, these are a lot of books that have influenced me over the years. An Infinite Journey by Andrew Davis is all those charts that I got on progressive sanctification. Um, Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges had a big Im impact on me in high school. The Whole Inner Holiness by Kevin DeYoung, where he's talking about, you know, actually, we do need to put effort and strive for holiness. It's not just a let go and let God, and it just automatically happens. Uh, we shouldn't be careless. Uh, Free Grace Theology, Five Ways It Diminishes the Gospel by Wayne Grudem. Uh, you've heard Dr. Mazak preach against Free Grace Theology, even if it's not by that word. But these people were basically like, well, I made a decision when I was like, two years old, and now I don't believe in Jesus, so I'm going to heaven anyways. That's free grace theology. Um, the Gospel According to Jesus by John MacArthur, where here he's talking about discipleship is part and parcel of salvation, and if you're truly saved, you will be a follower of Jesus. There's no such thing as people who are saved who don't follow Jesus. How Does Sanctification Work by Collison. He's a biblical counselor with CCEF. Um, Change into His Image by Jim Berg. I still find helpful things in there. Uh, Studies in Perfectionism by B.B. Warfield. Perfectionism is a different understanding of sanctification than progressive sanctification. They believe that you can be above this world of sin now in this life just by going through the right rituals and get onto this plateau of you don't sin anymore. Or at least you don't knowingly sin anymore. So it doesn't count if you don't knowingly sin, right? Mm -hmm. um, no Quick Fix by Andy Nacelli is also combating that. The Future of Justification by John Piper combats N.T. Wright's new perspective on Paul, which is the opposite extreme of, I have to do enough works in my life as a professing Christian to where I stand at the last judgment, and God's not going to let me into heaven unless my works um, not, not only evidence my salvation, but actually is the basis of my salvation. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's basically a halfway house to Roman Catholicism, that your works contribute to your salvation, and John Piper's combating that. Uh, Disciplines of a Godly Life by R. Kent Hughes is just a practical um, disciplines of a godly life. Prayer, scripture reading, fighting sin, so forth. Applied to different aspects of your life. Holiness by J.C. Ryle. He's a bishop from the 1800s. It's a classic book on holiness. Um, R. Kent Hughes set apart, uh, calling a worldly church a godly lifestyle. Very practical, helpful. Love Not the World by Randy Levy is a helpful book that avoids both legalism and license and talks about both of them being dangerous. And then there's just systematic theology books on sanctification by Wayne Grudem. Dr. McCune was my teacher at Detroit. Um, the other book I would recommend would be um, Mortification of Sin by John Owen. He was a Puritan in 1700s or something, so it's harder to read. There's a simplified, updated version by Chris Lundegaard called The Enemy Within. He's basing his book off of John Owen. Those are all very helpful resources on progressive sanctification, and hopefully that's helpful. If you want any of these resources, just email me. Let me know if you want to have them. But as you can tell, this is one of the parts of theology that I love studying because um, I spend a lot of time in this. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us together here as a church body, and we do pray that you would grow us to maturity in actually applying a biblical worldview to our lives and our personal behavior, that we would understand how to discern uh, from truth to application the, the biblical authority and how it's rightly to be interpreted to lead us to our convictions that actually result in concrete, practical um, behavior in our lives. And Help us uh, when we have disputes with others, not to just be angry, but to work through um, trying to understand what, what do you understand the Bible to be saying and why it should be applied in a certain way in these situations so that we can be iron sharpening iron and building each other up. Help us to avoid both legalism on one side and license on the other side and seek to be spirit-filled people who walk with you and because we're motivated by a great love for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.